I think that's there the one right there. The front tire went flat during that, which added to the uh, difficulty. <laughs> and excitement. Yes, if I want to shoot raccoons from the kitchen, I shoot raccoons from the kitchen. And the only one mad is my wife, so. <laughs> I'm the ranch manager of Iron Horse Bison. Um, my dad owns it. I run it for him. He lives in Nebraska. I live here on the ranch and manage the day-to-day -day for him. Um, we've been in the business since 2009. We bought this ranch, luckily, uh, kind of turnkey. Already had the animals on it. Um, so we bought the, the animals and the ground together. And been doing that ever since. Mostly cow-calf. A little bit of meat. Trying to get more into the meat market. This ranch was started in 1999. Um, by the previous owner. Um, he had a friend who's pretty big in the bison business. He's managed a couple of ranches and around. Um, and so they started at 99. Um, previous owner had an interesting gig. Um, his wife was a traveling pharmacist. She would spend about two weeks, three weeks in Alaska and then come back here. Um, he would spend his winters in Kansas and his summers in Alaska. Really? Yep. So this is a half section. He would lock uh, the animals in the south quarter, there was a windmill down there. I'd pay the farmer to check on them, make sure they had water. Um, he'd come back in the fall, he'd buy some feeder animals, he'd sell the calves, um, and then in the spring, he'd have the animals butchered by a new tra a trailer, new freezers, um, take it all up to Alaska, sell all the meat from the feeders he had, uh, sell the freezer, sell the trailer, and that was, that was his gig, he was retired army. Really? Um, my dad approached me in 2005 about getting into the bison business. Um, he was in the Marine Corps for 30 years and looking at what he wanted to do when he was done playing around. Um, I said, sure, you get into bison, I'll go into it. And I was at college. I changed my major from international business to agricultural business. <laughs> um, luckily, I was at Utah State, which is a land-grant ag school, so it was a, a good place to be to make that change. Um, he found this ranch on Craigslist. So, I already had animals here. Seriously? Yeah, seriously. It was a, <laughs> we found it on Craigslist. Um, came out here spring break of 09 uh, to tour the place. He bought it, and four days after graduating college in 2009, boom, I was on a bison ranch in Kansas. Uh, zero ag experience. You know, being in the Marine Corps, everywhere I've lived, either touched the ocean, my dad being in the Marine Corps, not me, or it was surrounded by the ocean. So I've lived big cities, the coasts. Um, and then boom, here with no pickup, a gas 3020 tractor that's still sitting over there, not working anymore. Yeah, my dad's thought was, hey, these, these, you know, they've lived here for millennia. This is where they grew up. They're pretty hands off. You let them be bison, they're, they're bison. And, you know, I, we have cattle neighbors. I have friends with cattle. I work for the USDA and make loans to farmers. And, you know, they're out there in February pulling calves because that's just what they do. And I'm like, why? <laughs> Why not do it different? Right. Uh, calving season for me is the best season. I usually go on vacation in April or May for at least a week. Really? Yeah. Nothing I can do. If it, if something goes wrong, what am I going to do? Nothing. So, you know, just count and, and watch is kind of how I handle it. You know, 12 years in, for the most part, pretty well. You know, you have a couple hiccups, a couple uh, learning experiences, a couple... Well, that doesn't usually happen, but it happens to you, so you get the the experience. I said we're mostly cow calf. We've done a little bit of meat, getting more into the meat side of things. Um, with COVID, I had more phone calls from meat than ever, but of course my local slaughterhouses were booked out way before I thought about getting a slot. So, do you know any reason why that is? Is people are people more health health conscious no. after it, or just all the cat? Well, just as for the selling of the meat and not getting in. Well, as for having a lot more calls. For the meat during COVID? No, I think just the rush, the grocery store, people seeing, you know, ground ground beef go for six, seven dollars a pound. They're like, well, I could buy bison for eight from you. I'm like, yeah, you could if I had any. Facebook, my wife, I am. I'm an introvert. I I, I was social distancing before it was cool. <laughs> uh, you know, I have pretty much no online presence, which that's just, just for me, but my wife handles all of that. So no, no website, no no real online sales other than her posting on Facebook of, hey, we'll be in Omaha, we got meat, what do you want? And then we can bring stuff up. You'll see a lot of my exterior fences aren't special at all. Um, what are they made out of? High tensile, 12 and a half gauge, uh, usually one or two hot wires. Um, all the exterior fence was put in by the previous owner. Um, up here, it's usually five strand, which is nice. <laughs> on the south quarter, 
Um, some of it's just two strands with an old barbed wire limestone deal falling down behind it. Really? Yeah, the south end of the property is pretty much just two strands. The neighbor guy came by, you know, knocked on the door, hey, get, get your horse, get your rope, whatever, you got a buffalo. I'm like, what? Um, <laughs> luckily, she was already headed back down there. He saw, he saw her on the road. Um, passed her over. I actually have a fence to come in from the south side, just two pickups, and gently convinced her to, to go in. And no deal. And then later on, I went around. The ground was a little soft. She had walked around the whole property, checking all the gates back into the property. She, she wanted back to the herd. And from what I can tell, she was on her way back down to the south when, when the neighbors saw her. So, knock on wood, that's the only off the property issue I've had. I've never had any get out, but I've heard that. that if you only have a handful get out, they just want to get back to the rest of the herd. Yeah. Neighbors make a huge difference in your operation. Luckily, our, the guy who farmed the ground for the previous owner still farms it for us. Um, he has a son about my age. Uh, but coming here with no experience, lacking certain pieces of equipment, um, good neighbors have made a huge difference. If my tractor goes down, I can borrow his to feed animals in the winter. Just good neighbors make a make a big difference, especially starting off. I can't say enough good things about about the guy who does our farming and then the personal help that he's done for us. Uh, I didn't like this gate over here because it was on a low point and always wet. So I put another gate in. I didn't pay attention and it was kind of in a low point and I, I had a bigger puddle. <laughs> Well, at least you have two options now. I have two options, both of which are <laughs> going to be muddy today. So, I mean, like here you can see all this blue stem. It probably needs to be burned or mowed. But, you know, here we are in September now. Obviously, we got five inches of rain this week, but there's still plenty of, of plant matter out here. Right. Um, I try to move them through every pasture three times during the dry season. Okay. How long do you keep them on that pasture, typically? In the beginning, about three days, and then by the end, a week or two, depending on what the pasture looks like and and rainfall. Okay. And how many different pastures you have now? I have nine. Nine. And you know, my bison are kind of cube trained, um, but I don't have to use cubes anymore. After after about the first two times through the first year, we set finished everything. They're smart. They know where they're going. They're, they move right along just fine. Really? Um, I don't know if it's just my my bison or buffalo, but when they're scared, they go south. And the only downside is my corral's on the north. <laughs> really? I don't know why. When they get nervous, they always like to go south. So I always trick them into the corral. Is is south the, the downhill, or is it just south? Just south. Really? Yeah. I mean, technically, I'm probably a little overstocked. I mean, there's 28 cows and two bulls some late calves and then all the calves this year um, on the property but the rain's been good the rotation of grazing is working and I haven't seen pastures go down and with, with the previous owner locked them in this quarter every summer they were really picky they would eat what they liked and left what they didn't and so I'm still working on trying to get them to eat everything I uh, I was ignorant to all things agriculture till I moved to this ranch in 2009 um, I grew up in the cities and the coast and overseas. I'm a military brat, so no no ag whatsoever. I did get an agricultural business degree when my dad asked me to join this future prospect of raising bison with him, so I did have that, but you know, that was just pounds of nitrogen versus toys from China when you when you do the equations on economics. So didn't really get any hands-on in college. I guess some welding in a tractor class, you know, rebuilding a motor. That was about it. Came to Kansas. Didn't have a pickup, had a gas 3020 John Deere tractor that didn't like to run. Didn't know what Milo was, thought it was a funny looking corn. Um, so I like to say, you know, I didn't have any bad habits when we when I started. I had no habits, nothing. If you look out your front window and you got your buffalo herd right there, that, that, is, that is pretty neat, not gonna lie. Um, got nothing bad to say about it. The, the worst thing is I grew up in cities, so did my wife. You know, Amazon hasn't built a drone that can get pizza delivered here. <laughs> um, that is that is one big downside is the lack of pizza delivery. Otherwise, I, I like having grown up in cities. You know, my nearest neighbor's three quarters of a mile away. The next one's a mile away. You can do what you want when you want. Nobody cares. You know, nobody's calling the cops on you. It's, it's 
it's unincorporated. If I want to shoot raccoons from the kitchen, I shoot raccoons from the kitchen. And the only one mad is my wife. So <laughs> <laughs> those are, uh, you know, having grown up not experiencing that type of freedom, I, I really enjoy it. I mean, there's pluses and minuses to everything, but there's a grocery store 12 miles away. Hayes is 35 minutes away. And there's an airport there that gets you to Denver and the rest of the world. So I don't feel like I'm quite in the middle of nowhere. I probably shouldn't do this, but I did this this year. I actually caught a calf with my hands, threw it in the in that truck in the back seat, and drove it to the herd. Um, I rotational graze, and it's normally not an issue, but the, the cow left this calf behind. It was rather new, and it wasn't going to come back when I was tired of sitting out there. And I, so I tried to get to the calf. Well, it ran north through the fence instead of west to the new pasture. So I had to go in there, chase it back to where it was, left it, came back, it was still there, mom didn't get it. So I finally caught it, picked it up, like I said, threw it in the truck, drove it to the pasture, opened the door and said, hope you find your mom. And I said, you probably shouldn't do that, but I did. And it's it's out there, it's with its mom, it's doing fine. Um, but there's still some smears on the back window from its nose and tongue as it was, you know, that was, I wish I could take in a, a, a video, but one hand on the wheel, one hand trying to keep it from jumping into the front seat. I did not get a, any pictures or video. I was I was a little stressed during the whole encounter. <laughs> I could see how that would be a little stressful. I first had a bigger tank with the contract. I got a smaller tank after it finally rusted out. But I have one, two, three, three spigots on the line here, plus a spigot in the corral, and a spigot in the northwest pasture. Um, all part of that equip. So this, this feeds off of a well by the old house, one horsepower, run, I think eight, 10 gallons a minute, which is all you need. Well, in the winter, I keep the animals in the north in the north half. Um, before I got into the equip contract for the, the waterway and, and future terracing, um, as long as we weren't growing wheat, they would get milo stalks, corn stalks, sorghum stalks, whatever we had out there, the farmer was fine with me throwing them out there. Um, and I, I do supplemental you know, feed in the winter. With this amount of acreage, you have to. Like I said, it's about 10 acres to a pair during the summer, and then in the winter, I do throw out a little bit, but I am pretty hard on them. Um, I do make them lose their 10% body weight. Mine do look pretty rough come March, April. Um, that's what people say you're supposed to do, and so I, I let them be bison. Helps, you know, the calving ease. You hear the stories, people want their buffalo looking pretty, so they, they feed them through the winter, and yeah, they look nice and round, but then it comes calving time and you have calving issues. You don't want an 80 pound calf, 60 pound calf. You want a 30 to 50 pound calf so they can they can clear it real easy and, and get on with life. Um, so I'll put out a bale, maybe two a week. If a storm's coming, I'll throw out maybe a couple more. So everyone does it a little different. There's no right or wrong way, and if you're not experimenting or trying things a little different, you know really not going to be learning anything so that seems to be working so far for us. All my cross fencing is just three wires. Um, I think the T post are 15 feet. I think I did 30. I don't know. It's just, I was running two hot wires on the first ones I did and I realized coyotes, raccoons, whatever kept knocking the hot wire off at the bottom. So the later ones I just put one hot wire in the middle. Um, I'm fortunate you know the animals were here before I was. The, the ones on in this ranch, you know, a lot of them, I do hold back a lot of my own heifers. So they're used to it. They really, they really don't test my fences. The fence behind you is not even hot. It hasn't been for years. Really? Yeah, it's just there. Yeah. So I, I did for a while and I got tired of finding fence faults all the time. And I said, well, I'm just going to take that off because I'm tired of <laughs> trying to hunt these down all the time. So like I said, every, everybody's heard different. Mine's been here a long time. It was closed for several years. I didn't bring in anything. Obviously, I bring in my bulls, and I brought in a couple cows. Um, but they're used to it, so they don't... It just works for us. <laughs> and I, I bought one, and I brought him in as a yearling, and I had the unfortunate pleasure of having him kill calves. Um, mamas were dropping calves April, May, and he was trying to separate the calves. He was young. I don't know if he thought they were, you know, going to cycle right back or, or what. But I lost two for sure and maybe a third um, to him. That was a fun experience. I went Man, out, that's terrible. I went out there on a dirt bike. Uh, my friend was in a pickup, and I rode in that herd and I cut him out of the herd and I drove him all the way to the corral. 
Yeah. That was a fun experience. I couldn't figure out my, why I kept falling over every turn I made. My front, front tire went flat during that, which added to the, uh, the difficulty. <laughs> and excitement. Yeah, I mean, there were, you know, there were new calves. So, I'll, you know, the, the cows were showing me their horns when I, would, when I was trying to pull him out. Um, so that was a learning experience. Haven't had it happen since. Got him out of here, traded him out. I think that's the is. one right there. Yeah, that was the one born Wednesday. So, what is she, two, three days old? Yeah, about three days old. That's pretty cool. So, luckily the heat, it was about 99 degrees on Wednesday. She survived that. We got the rain, so it's cooled down, so I think she'll be all right. She has a good mom. And that big bull right there, which uh, one's that? That's Ken. That's Ken. And rawhide is right there. Like I said, they How heavy do you think he is? I'm not a good estimator. I, I hope he's 2,000. I don't know if he's there. He's beautiful. Yeah. You said he's about 10 years old? Yep, 2011 was when he was born. When you use your corral once or twice a year, you have to build it to a price point. Yeah. I mean, this is continuous fence panel. If they really wanted to, they would destroy this. Sure. Um, I actually used green Orphelin panels as my exterior right here for 10 years. And it worked. And then I brought in a, a bred heifer and I was sorting her to get it to the herd. And she thought, nope, I'm going to take a shortcut. And she jumped over it. That's when I decided to upgrade. <laughs> Is that Orsland panel this height? Yeah, this green one's over there against that okay. fence. And it's, it's about pressure. I mean, like I said, for years, never a problem. Until one animal finally did it. And I said, okay, now it's time to, to upgrade. I need to replace some of those tarps. Obviously, it's been a windy year. I said I'm not really set up to finish animals, but I do a little bit. We used to we used to catch them in here. So this was green Orschlin panels. That was a was a wall of bales. Really? <laughs> it was a wall of bales. I made a wall of bales and then some more Orschlin panels there. I was able to get them in here. I'd close it, and then we would sort groups into that area. And off of there, there's an alley, and we would cut the calves off the cows in the alley. They'd either go to the trailer or the, or the alley also leads out to the field. We did that for four years. Um, and then we built the working area. And once again, it's, it's built to a price point when you only use it once or twice a year and you're running 25 cows. How much money do you want to put into it that makes sense? I mean, yeah, I'd love to have uh, steel posts welded up. Um, but that's just a hard cost to swallow when like I said you're running 25 cows right. and you're still paying and you're still paying for the land right. um, so we had a manual squeeze chute for a long time we've upgraded to a hydraulic last year actually um, don't know if we needed to but it's just a nice to have and it has a scale that was a big plus so last year was the first year I could hold back animals based on their weight versus I think you look big and I think you look small so what we do is they're all down there I sort off Groups about four to eight. I run them up the alley. They turn in here, the gate with the rope, and they're usually still running. Get them into the the box alley. Start sorting them down, and then this is just a big swinging gate. Had a welder come and put this on. I mean, it's nothing fancy, but there you go. You just made a an alley for them. You can run them in. How many pins do you have to sort them? Straight off this, I side dump anything I'm keeping. So the calves um, will go right out the side. I side dump. Off the front, if it's back to the field, I go right. They go to this, and then I run them out. And then if it's a yearling or something or a different sort, I can go left. So straight off of here, I can do three. Okay. Um, if it's four, it means they're in here with me, and that's a, that's a bad deal. <laughs> so. so you said uh, you, you generally don't like working the bulls through here? No. I mean, they're big. I mean, the, the squeeze chute can handle them. I mean, that's eight foot tall. It's seven foot tall on the other side. Um, it's just if, if they got into a bad mood, they can do a lot. Like, there's a bend in the top of that bow gate there. Um, I had a bull. He came in. He stood there for a while. He ran. He jumped. He hit it. And then he turned around and ran into the squeeze chute. But one hit, and he put a, a real nice bend in the top of that. And that's seven feet tall. Really? I mean, double bar. As you notice, lots of tarps. 
when we're working them, I'll come and I'll zip tie them back up. You know, the wind likes to take them down. I'm too lazy to take all these down and put them back up every year. Um, but it's all about sight lines. You know, normally if a bison or buffalo can't see through it, they're not going to go at it. And so you use these tarps to your advantage. Bison or buffalo? I raise buffalo and I eat bison. <laughs> That's the perfect answer. When I run them up, I have this alley narrows a little bit. It's a 12 foot gate there, 10 foot gate here. And this is a 12 foot gate that I open across the alley. So I chase them down on foot. They come through. I tell the person here to close the gate. They close it and then they just move, move through. Um, something I need to work on. I tried some, some like tinting film, which didn't work. They can see us from all these panels. I need to do a better job of them not being able to see out because that makes it harder sometimes for them to move closer to the squeeze chute. Um, I still don't have a great solution. Um, so when they come in here, they're coming in hot. as as like one, two? Usually about four to six. Okay. I, I mean, I don't like taking much bigger groups because you get some calves in there with a mean cow, they start more, or a yearling, and they start beating each other up pretty good. And then this just gets narrower and narrower as we go down? No, this stays, once they're in the box alley, it is the same width all the way until the, uh, this last section there where you can close that uh, that door. That's a little triangle. So you can take them from a triangle to a, to an alley size width and then right into the squeeze chute. So they're coming in as like two and three through uh -huh. here and then right here is one. Yep. So you try to sort just one into there. So you'll keep two, three together, probably just two. Um, and then you'll break one into here and try to get it to run in. Um, calves, usually not a problem. Some cows, not a problem. Some cows, big problem. Um, they've done it too much and they just get tired of it. You, know, you can waste 20 minutes on one cow and sometimes you just give up <laughs> and run them back out and say, nope, not this year. Yeah, I can, with, with a poor on dewormer, she can get dewormed. She's not going to get her shot. Um, if she's a keeper, just open it and let her just run out. Okay. So from what we're told, this is the original homestead on the property. It had two rooms and then a lean-to kitchen on the uh, south side. Eight, late 1800s is my guess. You know, these are all stories passed down to me by others. So that's, that's all I know. Probably 1880s, 90s, best guess. Oh, we, we bought this in 15 at auction. You know, auctions are fun. They have a bidding period and then there's a break so people can go talk to the bankers and then you come back from break. And there's more bidding and came back from break. We were the highest bidder. And then in the last 30 seconds, someone started raising their hand and pushed it up. It was either 50 or $60 an acre in the last 30 seconds, which was unfortunate, but oh, no. it's a it's a nice quarter. It's 100 acres of grass, 60 dry land, and there's a lot of grass out here. What do you do with it? This is where I run my feeders, the yearling animals and my replacement heifers. Okay. So they just get dropped out here in the spring. We pick them up in the, in the fall and uh, the replacement heifers will go to the herd and the feeders will stay in the corral until it's time to take them to slaughter. How deep? It's about 340 is what they drilled it to and I think the pump's at about 300. Um, it's a solar well pump and where the animals are out here and only in the summer, it works just fine. I drain the tank so we don't worry about ice in the winter. Um, I have no intention really of keeping animals out here in the winter at this point. So. Nice little, little setup. This is a portable corral. I had it, uh, this one's I think called the Duke, made by Blattner out of Cimarron. Um, heavy duty. I had some modifications made for the buffalo. I had the alley fully sheeted. Have, they have no backs on them if you want. I didn't want those. 
And then on the small side, I had them add an extra bar to these panels. So they're about seven feet tall. Um, Cause you trap them and then you bring a group into here and you close this up and then you get them to go down the alley to the trailer. So I, at least this area I wanted nice and tall and hopefully nobody jumps out. How many animals can you work in a system like this? I don't know. The most I've ever had in there is 12. Okay. I mean, you know, they always talk cattle numbers with portable corrals and like, oh, this one can hold 80 head, this one can hold 100 head. Yeah, but bison don't like to be crammed together like cattle do. And I mean, you got to convince the whole herd to get in here. So if it's, you know, I really, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Maybe one day I'll find out. But right now it's only about 10 to 12 that I, I ever put in here. So then are you taking and bringing a squeeze chute for that or? Nope, are... ju just the trailer. Okay. If I don't so work. just loading them up. Just loading. I mean, if you wanted to, you could absolutely bring a squeeze chute out, drop it right there. or. Uh, a holding section before it, portable scale. Um, those are all options, absolutely. And you can make some designs with this where you can cut that in half and you can actually have a catch pin coming out of here. You can make three pins out of this if you wanted to do that. You know, those are all, all options. Appreciate you guys watching. Thank you for joining us. My name is Noah Gordon. We are Broken Arrow Bison and we will see you next time.